Hi there. You're listening to an audio message recorded from Glen Eden Church in East London, South Africa. Our desire is to become followers of Jesus by knowing Jesus, being with Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. Now, on to today's message. God bless you. Morning, everyone. For those watching on YouTube at 10 o'clock, and for those listening now, or sneaking in in later, uh, wherever you might be right now, praise God that although apart, we can be together. I wanted to actually do a little moment of reflection on our God and then lead us towards some worship. And then the second part of this will be our message because I just feel so excited. I've been geeking out this week on some reading that I've been doing around uh, science and how the astronomy discoveries that have happened of late and our cosmology. And so let me just give you some kind of context here that's just totally excited me and it made me think uh, this is this is uh, this is something that led me in worship and I want to actually lead you all in worship but a, a new discovery has been made all right and it's taken 400 scientists over a period of nearly seven years 25 institutions all working together to take fresh photos of the sky and map it out, okay? And they did this over the course of 758 nights. Um, now, using this incredible massive telescope in Chile, uh, they were mapping out the sky for these years and then putting all their data together to compile a fresh image of the universe and it's taken you know nearly now two years to release their discovery and uh, the findings have been incredible this team combined this catalog of hundreds of billions of galaxies and looking at the light reflection the tiny distortions of, of the shapes of these galaxies they, they used to measure now out the universe and up until now, um, Einstein's theory of relativity has been all about how the universe is moving, expanding, collapsing, and its apparent age. Now, something that is still undisputed is that all of this began from one tiny, mind-boggling, tiny point as one article puts it. Now, there suddenly have appeared these new cracks in the cosmological theories. And Carlos Frank, um, one of the cosmologists involved in actually working on developing Einstein's theories even more, um, he, he said this to the BBC in an interview. I spent my life working on this theory which is the structure of formation based on Einstein's theory in 1918. And my heart tells me I don't want to see it, this new discovery, okay? But my brain tells me, he says, that the measurements were correct and we have to look at the possibility of brand new physics. Now, what's this brand new physics, okay? For, for all these years, uh, cosmologists have believed a certain way of, of measuring and calculating the speed of growth of the universe. Um, it's anticipation that one day it'll collapse on itself. Um, and so from the Science of Techno Technology Facilities Council, they write the following. There's a whole lot we don't know when it comes to what's now freshly discovered in the dark parts of the universe. Okay, so if you look up in the sky and you see the stars and you see the Milky Way, I mean, you just want to just glory in the 
magnitude of that, and if you're living out on the East Coast, particularly where there's not a lot of light pollution at night, you get to see this, and it's just extraordinary. Every now and again, you might see a shooting star um, or a passing satellite, okay? But the gaps in between those stars and our Milky Way has come to be known as dark matter. Now, just bear, hold, hold on with me here, all right? Um, we, we, they say in the, the, the council journal, we're, with technology as it advances, we're edging closer towards the truth. Now, the truth of what? This freshly mapped out dark matter that uh, has been discovered as the spider web in the universe that's, for their language, holding universe, uh, holding galaxies and planets and stars and moons together, okay? And they call it dark matter. Now, why it's dark is because its gravitational pull is so strong that light can't escape. It doesn't reflect light, and they've come to observe this over the course of these years. Now, I don't want to lose you, okay? So I'm going to wrap it up. But that, in, in terms of this discovery, that when you look up into the sky, what we can't see, the blackness, is not nothingness. The blackness is an energy. Some cosmologists are coining the phrase dark energy. Um, it's making up up to 80% of the substance of the universe. So if you were to look up and see the, the Milky Way and now the stars at night, okay? That's just the galaxy we're part of. And there are millions of others, okay? But the substance that we cannot see, this dark matter, is a substance that's actually holding the universe together. And they've mapped this out. And if you want to go and uh, geek out on some of this information like I did, uh, you can go and, and find it online. But here's what the Bible says about this freshly discovered dark matter that's holding the universe together. The psalmist writes in, Chapter 8, verse 3 to 4. And when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? So the writer is doing what we would do at night, just look up and go, wow. And acknowledge God's the creator of all this, and you've put everything in place, verse 3 tells us. And then the writer asks this question, what is humanity that you would care for us? And I loved in Phil's devotion that went out this previous week, he spoke about the ultimate show of God's care in sending Jesus to us to become a sacrifice for us. So what is man that you would do this? this? What is man that you would send Jesus to us when we're looking up at the universe? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says the following, He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Now, he, remember, he ascended in bodily form. He took everything that he had with him to the Father. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And Hebrews says he is the exact imprint of God. And get this, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Hebrews 11 verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Hebrews 11 verse 3. Now get this, technology has evolved to the point where they can map out the universe and discover, wait a minute, 
The blackness is not just nothingness, it's something. There's a power holding all the galaxies in place. Gravity is so powerful that it's keeping our Milky Way exactly where it needs to be. Hey, the Bible's been telling us this all along as if it's a fresh discovery. No, it's not. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Hebrews 11, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Oh, just join me in a little bit of imagination. Imagine for a second that our telescopes are actually now discovering the word in power that holds our universe in place. That's Jesus. And that Jesus came for us, died for us, rose for us, ascended to the Father for us, and now is building his church. That Jesus holds the universe by the word of his power. And now scientists are saying what we thought we knew, we don't know anymore. And maybe it's time for some new physics. Well, what we don't know, we don't know. And who knows what is still to be discovered, but maybe, just maybe, finally, not only are scientists saying there was a creator that started this all, how did it come from one tiny explosive point? Creative design, and now we're mapping out something that's holding the universe. We say, could it be Jesus? Yes, it is Jesus. Let's listen to this song and just in awe and wonder, worship together. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high, and I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise Him.
Good morning, precious church family. This is Shona. In these troubling and uncertain times, when we are all feeling isolated and fearful and a little lost, when so many around us, our friends and loved ones and family, are testing positive and we are filled with fear and a longing to connect, for a touch, for some small, normal thing in our lives to cling to, It's never been more apt that we are on this journey to know Jesus, to be with Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. Graham once said that the universe needs to see the church on display, and that there was nothing like the local church when it was working right, that as a church we represented the fullness of Christ. He also encouraged us to fill every space with the presence of God. To me, a silver lining of COVID-19 fallout is a sense of community getting stronger, of us finding different ways of coming together to make sure that our neighbours are supported and cared for. We have been mandated as believers to proclaim the good news of repentance for the forgiveness of our sins to the entire world. Hebrews 10 verse 24 suggests that we consider how we spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us pray. Lord God, you are our refuge and stronghold. You have taught us to love our neighbor and to care for those in need as if we were caring for you. Give us strength, Lord, to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick, and to assure the isolated of our love and your love. We glorify and thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. Go with us today, Lord, and bless us through your presence. Remind us that you are our tower of strength, our fortress, and our rescuer. Everything we need is found in you. Open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Shauna, for that just wonderful introduction. I'm so excited. Uh, As you could have heard in our moment of just worship, how excited I am. I want to say happy birthday to my precious wife, Jo. Um, I hope you just wearing the biggest neon 90s gear you've got right now. Um, She's a child of the early 90s. And so I've been blessed with the most incredible plan A gift that God has put together. So now, in our time that's remaining, we're going to ask ourselves the question, so what is chapter 2 of Acts, verse 42 to 47, telling us? And I'm going to invite you to turn with me there now, and maybe in the, the microphone, I can even listen to that. What's the sound of paper? I love reading out of um, paper, my paper Bible, because I've got apps everywhere on my laptop and iPad and phone. But it's just something so lovely from the smell. Ask my, ask my family. They're so embarrassed when we go into a bookstore and I go to one of the books and I open it and flick through the pages with my nose right there and I inhale that delicious, lovely smell. All right, it's one of my little oddities, but we're all, uh, we all got something. All right, so we're going to look at three areas this morning that, that Luke records for us. Now, this is one of the summaries in the book of Acts, okay? Luke spends a lot of detail in narrative, and he then will go to summary. This is summary of Acts, Okay, in the the form of what this early Christ follower community looked like. And so he spends loads of verses prior to this with Peter's sermon on that day when 3,000 were added. So now we've got 3,120 Christ followers. Now what? And then Luke goes into a brief summary of what they would do when they were together. Um, it's not just a chronological 
the book of Acts, there are moments where Luke summarizes for us, and this is one of those summaries. So, just to remind ourselves, let's read verse 42 to 47 together, but we're going to look at three areas this morning of what is the local church, okay? What is the local church? Now, I I want to almost draw your attention back to what I shared in that moment of, of just worship. If cosmologists have discovered that what we thought we knew of the universe, we don't entirely know, and we are open to new possibilities, could I ask us to freshly read this text with the, the eyes and the ears of, of, of inquiry, inquiring about the local church? For some, we, we think we know what it is. For others, it's a building. For some, uh, you can even picture the seat you'd sit in and say, that's my seat in my church. That's... That's uh, where I want to be. As we looked last week, some even asked the question um, of finding a church based on what can it meet my needs? Can it meet the needs of my family? All right, so we've got various um, interpretations of what the local church should be, and no doubt throughout history the church has evolved and denominations have come in, and uh, we've got weird and wonderful but could it be that God loves the weird and the wonderful in that he is so diverse, he has allowed Christ followers to meet in culturally specific ways from under trees in the shade to uh, large auditoriums with thousands of people gathered, but there still needs to be the central reality of what is the local church. And so let's read it with inquiring minds right now as we almost have a blank canvas before us and we say let's discover again what is this community of followers that I have been gifted to be part of so verse 42 and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers and all came upon every soul some translations say fear. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. And praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. God, we just commit this morning's uh, reading of your word uh, to our hearts. Holy Spirit, take it, ignite it. Um, we come with inquiring hearts, uh, not crit Critical hearts, but inquiring hearts, show us freshly what the local church is meant to be, God, as we journey through the book of Acts, but now this morning as we spend time together. And so I'm going to spend time in just uh, one verse, okay? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Devoted. Make a note of that. Um, something that we're going to look at. To teaching and fellowship. Look at that. And the breaking of bread and prayers. And so, God willing, we're going to cover the, those three themes this morning. In the, in the life of the local church, again, this is a summary. So if you were to stretch out the entire book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 to 28, this is Luke's summary of what they were doing when they would gather. Okay, It's not suddenly... 3,000 people, and then the next day they were so super organized. This developed over time as the church's rhythm. Now this word devoted. It's an interesting word, and it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people in different ways. Devoted to a partner, devoted to a child, devoted to one's job, devoted to one's pastime, devoted to eating healthy. This word has many different attachments in the English language. But let's look at it a little bit deeper. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 says the following. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day when Jesus wraps up human history, that day drawing near. And so Hebrews 10 lays out for us a command and not a suggestion. Let's hold fast the confession that we have without wavering. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and they devoted themselves to fellowship, Hebrews 24. Let's consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. And so the early church had this commitment not only to, to truth and we would say now doctrinal purity and certainty, but a commitment to one another. And they went hand in hand. And so often the modern Christian is one who say, would say, oh, I, I love just being with um, people. I love my Christian friends, whether it be my, the group I gather with in the building or now during this lockdown, uh, those I just keep in contact with. I'm committed to them. Others would say, I'm, I'm committed to just listening to the word and Give me a good preacher and I will uh, be totally content with that. They were, they were devoted to both. Okay, both. And this word, uh, kononia, is an interesting word. It's been thrown around uh, throughout church history. But it, it doesn't just mean a mutual common friendship. It, it actually expresses the sharing of life together. Doing life together is what we see they were devoted to. And so some commentators have proposed that out of the 3,120, there were 12 disciples. Remember, they swapped out Judas, who's dead, for Matthias. We got 12. And then they decide, okay, boys, um, we're each going to take 300 for now, and um, we're going to find room together. It seems manageable. But um, let's, uh, let's divide this large bunch into manageable communities and um, just go along with this thought with me. And each took about 300 and someone. Now, the temple was massive in structure. And so there were porticos. There were places to, to have a gathering of 300 people quite easily. Um, and so there is po the possibility that they were meeting very quickly in smaller, manageable groups. But then with, even within that larger 300, uh, there's the suggestion that they were in their homes doing things together. We'll get there later, but just bear this in mind. So they gather together. Now, in the, in the early moments of the church coming into life, they would still go to the temple. But the temple was a huge facility, as I've said. So they were using it as a space to gather um, Sure, no, no doubt, there were still many who felt like they needed to keep up some of the Jewish traditions of prayer and worship at the temple, and that was part of their progression. But they used that temple space to meet, and so oh, I just imagine, you know, Peter with the 300-odd here, and James and John, Matthias even, although we don't know anything about him, um, having his group. Now, what we do know is that they had 40 days of Jesus downloading to them biblical truth from Genesis to the end of the Old Testament. And almost all of that was expressed and told to them by Jesus himself. Certainly the Holy Spirit then took that and, and kind of embedded it into their memories because they were the 12 chosen to establish the New Testament church. And so their teaching was straight from Jesus, but it would have included all the Old Testament text and no doubt narrative about what Jesus had done, those that had been eyewitnesses and, and reminded this crowd of new believers what Jesus had, had done. So they were devoted to this. And the apostles certainly weren't just, you know, 
thumb-sucking new sermons every time they gathered, but they had enough. They had 40 days of, of high, intense download from Jesus and now fueled by the Holy Spirit to teach the people. Uh, Paul later would tell the Philippians um, in terms of this fellowship that they grew in together, this sharing of life together. He says in Philippians chapter 4, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, um, with my prayer, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Okay, so from the first day that someone started gathering until Paul is writing that letter, he says, I'm celebrating in prayer because of your partnership in the gospel, your kononia, your sharing life together in the gospel, and now with Paul, sharing with him in the gospel. And then to the Corinthians, Paul also writes chapter 1, verse 9 of 1 Corinthians, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we could take this fellowship, this devotion to teaching and doctrine, Bible reading and prayer and meeting in the temple, meeting in homes. At a human level, they were committed to this. But Paul reminds the Corinthians, you were called into fellowship of his son. And so what unites every one of us, where, where are you sitting listening this morning? And if you're still on time with us, it's um, maybe just after half past 10, if my clock would be right here. Uh, for the Sunday, um, you were called to Jesus, and in, in bringing, being into fellowship with Christ, you were into fellowship in His body, and so that that for 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 the Corinthians was so important. What kept them together? But now I want to ask this question just for a moment, just to push pause on: If the Bible says we're devoted to teaching, they were devoted to one another, to fellowship, to breaking of bread. And, prayer, why are so many, uh, and throughout the centuries it's been true, but let's just take now during this pandemic, why are so many falling away uh, from church, feeling connected, uh, falling away from fellowship, uh, and, and some even claiming to, oh, I've left this Christian thing. Um, and throughout the last two years, there's been a very large trend of what's called deconstructionism. And it's deconstructing uh, one's faith. And the danger is you begin by believing the Bible isn't inerrant or God's word anymore. And therefore, you can adapt it to your culture and your preferences. And when that begins to happen, you begin to deconstruct even your faith. So here's a quote that I read this week, and it's really interesting. I want to read this quote to you. Today, church attendance in America is declining. Many Christians are walking away from their faith once getting to college or entering the workplace. Ministries and churches are fighting to stay relevant with millennials. Um, and that's the, the current age group or moving into the next generation. But our nation is seeing a generation walk away from God as if he were merely a fashion trend that's no longer in style. Quote goes on. So what do some Bible memory verses and a church attendance decline? What, what does, what, so what do some Bible memory verses and a church attendance decline have to do with one another? Interesting, right? Because, you know, back in the, the old days, it was just memorizing scripture, teaching children and you know, going to church on Sunday. Well, what does the decline of this have to do with one another, the author writes? And here's the proposed answer. We have perhaps trained up a generation to know Jesus as a correct answer instead of actually knowing him as a person. Wow. And so the, our church journey is to 
know Jesus, be with Jesus, do what Jesus did. And this series through the book of Acts is learning to do what Jesus did and seeing how it unfolded. But I think there's some truth to the author's claim. We've trained up a generation to know Jesus as the correct answer to questions instead of actually knowing Jesus the person. And maybe that is why now suddenly there is such a decline in those claiming not only to have walked away from church and walked away from fellowship, but even themselves walking away from that faith that they once held. And so 1 Timothy 4.13, Paul writes to Timothy, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. And so Paul reminds Timothy even, this is what you've got to do. Until I, I'm with you, devote yourself. And it's, it's sometimes just wonderful. Imagine for, for half an hour, we just read a whole chunk of Scripture together and then prayed and said, Amen. Nothing wrong with that. The Holy Spirit could teach us so much through that. He says, devote yourself to teaching. Devote yourself to exhortation. There was a church that went so wild, uh, Paul had to bring them back to what was really important, and that was the Corinthians. Uh, they went so wild and they devoted to gathering and fellowship together that they lost the track of reading Scripture and exhorting and being taught. I mean, they just went wild on the spiritual gifts, okay? And Paul commends them for desiring the, the gifts. Uh, he says, especially prophecy. But, but then he says to them, you know, if I come to you and someone speaks a tongue of angels, it, it's only going to make the outsider totally confused and possibly even the speaker not know what they're talking about. He says, verse 3, On the other hand, though, if one prophesies, exhorts, speaks about God to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Well, the one who speaks in an angelic tongue, as we saw on the day of Pentecost, possibly some were doing that and others were proclaiming in the languages heard by those nations. Um, you just build yourself up. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. And then Paul says in verse 5, Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. So Paul's heart here is not to squash the use of spiritual gifts, but to say, hey, there's a place for building up the church, and that's central here. Not just everybody in, in, the, in Corinth just getting up and, you know, hundreds standing up and all just speaking in tongues. And he says in verse 6 of chapter 14, If I come speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Even if lifeless instruments, such as the flute and the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. Oh, there are doubtless many different languages in the world. And none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker will be a foreigner to me. So with yourself, since you are eager for the manifestations of the Spirit. And, that, and that's no understatement for this church in Corinth. Paul says, strive to excel in building up the church. And so the use of the spiritual gifts was not being squashed. And so some might say, well, you know, in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, it was a, a moment where speaking in tongues was more of an evangel evangelistic phenomenon in that moment because everybody you know, heard the language. But Peter has to get up and say, you know what, these people aren't drunk. So they're 
probably was some babbling or weird angelic language that for them was foreign at the time going on, as well as others miraculously declaring the praises of God in foreign languages so that all those gathered could hear. So if it was all just intelligible, Peter wouldn't have to say, hey, guys, this bunch isn't drunk. It's only nine in the morning. And so there was the both and, all right? But Paul was saying, build the church up. Use the gift of prophecy. New Testament prophecy is that of declaring God, His greatness. He might give you just words of wisdom, words of insight uh, to declare His nature to somebody who needs it at a particular time. And so this kononia echoes actually what was a, an ancient um, quote by Aristotle. He says... Friends have all things in common. That was written down in Greek way before Acts chapter 2 was written. And so the, the adage in ancient Greek, friends have all things in common, doesn't refer to the fact that you choose people like yourself, but friends share all things. It's lovely, isn't it? So that's why we could see the early church having so much in common because suddenly when you committed to one another, when you devoted to uh, this kononia, sharing life together, and oh, one day when we can do this properly together, sharing life, not sharing meetings, sharing life, oh, we'll have so much more in common. Now, on to our next uh, reality that is spoken about in verse 42. And we talk about the breaking of bread and prayers. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it seems that when they ate together, um, which was sometimes called a joy festival or a love feast, um, they'd get together and just eat together around the table. Now, remember the table. We've been speaking about this for some months now. That's going to be central to our gatherings during the week and even Sunday. Now, like today, we call this Family Sunday. We're going to share communion together, wherever you might be, around the table, the Lord's table, though, when we call that. But it seemed customary that after every big meal, they would have a moment of just gathering together, bringing out some bread and some red wine, sweet wine, which was non-alcoholic, or grape juice possibly, and just thank God for Jesus. And remember the words that Paul would later lay out that this bread is broken and this cup we drink in the memory of his blood shed for us. But it seems like the, the breaking of bread and the prayers were, were synonymous of both celebrating a meal together, enjoying company together, but then also sharing the Lord's table together, all right? And it, it begins to outwork itself as we go through the book of Acts, but we already begin to see their being organized, you know? It wasn't just uh, all night, every night, gathering and eating and being together. That might have been necessary for some who had no longer places to live because they, their faith in Christ called caused persecution to come upon them. But in Acts chapter 70, uh, 20 verse 7, I beg your pardon, uh, Paul writes, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Luke writes, sorry, Acts 20 verse 7, when we were gathered on the first day of the week to break bread, Paul talked with them because he was about to leave the next day. So here's something interesting, okay? As we're inquiring, God, what is this community? What should it look like? How should it operate? What, what, what kind of organizational levels should there be to keep the momentum going together? Well, Luke says on the first day of the week, so they, they've established something, okay, about the first day of the week. And we were gathered together to break bread. That's certainly to share uh, communion, the Lord's Day, together. All right? 
And Paul directs later on, um, we will see in the book of Acts, when he's with the Corinthians, um, he tells them that the churches of Galatia, on the first day of every week, should collect um, money and put it aside, just as he may prosper. So as, as he has enough, as he feels to give, um, and, and the generosity overflowing, no doubt, set it aside so that when I come on the first day of every week, or when you do gather on the first day of every week, we don't have to take up the offering then when Paul arrives. He was obviously coming to spend a few days with them. But he's told the Corinthians now that he's told the Galatians the same thing. Um, when you gather on the first day of every week, now we see something incredible begin to take place because this is going to shape not only uh, how the church gathered in larger settings, but how the calendar would be shaped. And Constantine would rework the entire calendar around the actual gathering of the church, believe it or not. And our wording here is going to show us something interesting. But right at the last en end of the book end of this Bible, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, we have uh, John record that it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now we've got something interesting. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they devoted to meeting together. We see Acts chapter 20, Luke say that they met the first day of the week to break bread. There's something significant because they were working possibly six other days of the week uh, in the fields or in their marketplace or with their trade or whatever was taking place. So they began to say, let's set aside one day that we all get together to break bread. And now John calls that day, which was already termed the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. Where did we get that from? Where, why, why the Lord's Day? Why, why did that day become so special uh, for the early church? You know, why not just make it a Wednesday, you know, right in the middle of the week? Or, well, because Mary and others found the tomb empty on the first day of the week. Now, Jesus rose on that day from the tomb. They found it empty, and it's called the first day of the week in the scriptures. And now, the first day of the week was, in Jewish custom, the day after Sabbath. And for them, the Sabbath was a day of rest from work, time of worship and prayer, and that was a Saturday. Now, we might think that already they had the days of the week numbered, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I mean, um, named. But they didn't. They only had the Sabbath, and then it started day one through to day six, and then the Sabbath. So they just called their days by number. But now we've got the first day of the week, number one, being referred to as the Lord's Day by John. And... In church history, we, we begin to learn that the, the 12 apostles wrote a document called the, the Didache in Greek, and it's dated somewhere between AD 17, AD 120. But in the Didache, which is kind of like the manual for the church, because now the 12 were, were dying out, and they've remaining some and others too with them, together with the doctrines that they were putting in place, taught by Jesus, uh, led by the Holy Spirit, wrote a kind of a manual of how to gather, how to have a local church, how to organize yourselves together. And they used this word in the Didache, um, gather on the Lord's Day. Every Lord's Day, quote, gather yourselves together and break bread and give thanksgiving. So we see not scriptural, but a document put together for the early church where they were, were told, hey, here's the best way we've figured this out. Uh, on that first day, because it's the Lord's day, because it was the day now remembered as when he rose, gather yourselves together. So we have a bit of a scriptural leading, but also a cultural leading, just out of possible common sense where they were saying together, on that day, we are going to gather. 
and we're going to break bread and we're going to pray and we're going to have exhortation and we're going to have the, the workings of the gifts and we're going to have the church gathered together to build itself up in love. Now, you can go into much more detail. We don't have time for that as to why Sunday is called Sunday. But interestingly enough, in older Russian, not so modern Russian, the, the word Sunday in Russian means resurrection. And even um, one of the church fathers, early fathers, as he's known, Jerome, would write, if pagans want to call um, the Lord's Day Sunday or the Day of the Sun, we willingly agree for today, on this day, the light of the world was raised and today is revealed the Son of Justice with healing in his wings. And so there was a cultural adaptation with Constantine and Jerome was kind of trying to make sense of, look, we've We've taken on a name here for this day, Sunday, which has another historical context. But if it's about celebrating the sun, why not? Because we have someone greater than the sun. And, the, and um, um, Francis of Assisi would go on to write a beautiful hymn um, of which we have a modern translation. But he would say that the sun is the greatest object in the universe that gives any comparison to Jesus, the Savior of the world. And so now we've looked at devoted, devoted to hearing teaching from Jesus, devoted to being together in presence and heart, and gathering to break bread and pray. And we're going to look at the rest next Sunday together, just kind of piquing your interest as we inquire. God, if scientists have freshly discovered that what they thought they knew of the universe is not entirely true and there's new discoveries out there, oh God, now teach us, show us. Uh, what it looks like to be a community of faith that's centered around Christ, knowing Jesus, being with Jesus, doing what Jesus did. As we now gather around the Lord's table, I pray you, Holy Spirit, would through the gathering of your people embody the presence of Christ as we celebrate Christ's death and resurrection. And so now there's going to be a song that's going to play, which will give you time to just get out the the two elements, the bread and the grape juice. And either while the song's playing or after you've listened and read the lyrics, partake together as a family. Get your kids. They're running around now. Bring them in. As couples, if you're on your own, thank God that you are part of the body of Christ as we celebrate all this together. Church, may Jesus show us how loved we are and how privileged we are to be part of the church. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree Body bowed and drenched in tears, they laid him down in joy. 
Joseph's tomb, the ancient seal by heavy stone, Messiah still and all. Jesus' face.